from here, we could look at the um, main jig that I use a little, a little bit more in detail, and I'll explain how I built it. Um, before we get to that, uh, I don't know if you can get over here. One of the things that I have found particularly useful in um, sawing is to use these blade stiffeners on both sides of the blade. Um, now, most of the time, uh, there, there are two different types of table saws. One is a belt-driven saw where the motor kind of hangs off the back or down below, and there's a belt that comes up to the, to, the, <clears throat> to the arbor, to the bearing on the arbor. And that will help to um, isolate the blade a little bit from the vibrations of the motor. There are other kinds where it's a direct shaft from the motor right to the arbor. And on those designs, uh, there's a lot more motor vibration that's transferred to the, to the blade. Um, so no matter how much vibration you have coming up through your arbor, I like to use blade stiffeners on both sides because it really cuts down on the amount of so run out. both sides. Oh, yeah. Let's see, we'll get over the top. Yeah, I don't know whether we can see that or yeah. not. But so it's just a uh, okay. flat plate that stiffens the blade. Um, that's really all it does. And it, um, it uh, prevents the blade from, from too much run out as the, as the um, arbor uh, in the center shaft vibrates. It's going to transmit up to the top of the blade. And, and so the teeth will vibrate back and forth. That's called run out. Um, so the, the stiffener make, makes a big difference on uh, surface finish on the sides of the sticks. And um, we were just talking about this on this um, African blackwood. Yeah, How the well, surface finish looks on the side. There are some swirl marks that you can kind of see. And the blades make a big difference too. I, the blades I like are the Freud Ultimate Cutoff. It's got 80 teeth. Uh, and it's a full curve um, plate on the blade. Sometimes you'll see teeth a, bit, a little bit wider than the plate. I like the plate to be, to be there uh, the full width of the kerf um, because it's just more material, more stiffness left on the blade. Uh, okay. It doesn't vibrate as much. So onto the jig. This is probably uh, uh, at least a sixth generation jig. I've made at least six different uh, sequential copies of this jig that I use to cut coffin um, building blocks out of. Uh, so by no means is this the first off uh, jig that I've ever made. I learn little things as I go uh, and build in adjustability where I know I need it. Um, that only comes through experience. But um, maybe I can uh, streamline things a little bit for those out there um, getting started. So <clears throat> first of all, the, the jig needs to stay flat to the table. So this is made out of Mike 6 aluminum, which is a tool plate. It's a cast aluminum that's controlled as it cools very, very carefully so that it doesn't build up residual stresses within the plate. So when you drill it or you cut it, it doesn't warp. And so it should be stable for a very long time. Um, the bars up here are Mike 6 aluminum as well. Pretty expensive material, so I put a pretty good investment into the jig. But like I said, that's the sixth time around I've tried to make this jig right. And so I really wanted to go all the way and, and get it right. Um, and so then the next thing was uh, to build the cradles. Um, when, I, when I built these cradles, I only had the ability to cut plastic. I couldn't, and, and plastic is a little bit more stable than the wood is uh, over time, a little more durable, um, and I think a little bit more stable um, with moisture, maybe a little less stable with temperature. But the plastic, I think, is HDPE here, and I had the ability to cut that with just uh, standard woodworking tools. With the mill now, I'd like to uh, change this over to aluminum and use aluminum cradles here because the plastic is a little soft and it deforms under the load of these clamps. If I, if I tighten the clamps down too hard on a stick, it will change the, the angle and slightly move the, the cradles a little bit. So I'd like to improve that as I go, but now I have the capability to do that. Um, these cradles are actually two separate pieces on each side here. So I cut just a bevel, a 45 degree bevel on one side and, and on the other. There's a little groove at the bottom. Um, that's important because chips need to be able to fall down into that. You don't want to have a, a, a V that comes together perfectly or little chips will build up in there and then it will high center your stick and it won't be flat. Um, and so, so they're two separate pieces and they're screwed down to the wood base which is then screwed to the aluminum uh, sled here. And the point there is that I can remove, if, if I find that the the miter angle is not exactly 45 with the, with the blade and this will change over time. I have to um, come and adjust this um, periodically. I'll go and check it and, and sometimes it's off. So what I do is I loosen one, I'll pull it back from, from the other and slip a little feeler gauge in there um, to make a very, very fine adjustment. So there's like a three thousandths feeler gauge that I would stick down between the two cradles. Then I'll push it back up here tight 
fasten the screws back down, and then pull out the feeler gauge, loosen this side, push it back up to the new location on, on this one, and that's how I can make very, very slight adjustments angle-wise um, with the blade. And so then it's important to cut, um, to cut both, um, and so here's the, how I measure it. Uh, so what I do is I put what looks like a, just basically an elongated center block. Um, I put it in both sides. Uh, I cut this side with it, then I turn it around, and I cut this side with it, make another cut, and then I check it with a square. Use a nice engineer square and put the, put the stick in there and hold it up to the light. And there shouldn't be any light crack between the block and the square, which this one looks pretty good. Yep. So that's how I do that. Um, it's important to cut both sides of the stick here because uh, any little error is multiplied by two uh, on the comparison to the 90. Here. So you can multiply your errors and you can get the angle um, even more accurate if you can multiply things by two. I do the same thing on the top jig here. And then once I get this, the left side of the, the top jig, uh, the top cradle here aligned, then I'll use a straight stick to align the right side with it. Okay. So that's how I adjust the, um, the cradles. And I used to build cradles all in one piece, um, but then it, it was hard to adjust them and make that real fine adjustment. Um, so, so that's one thing. Then um, cutting the sticks, I think, has been pretty well discussed already um, around the puzzle circles and the puzzle community. It's not a real mystery how to cut coffin blocks anymore. Um, but one thing that I did learn is um, it's hard to, it's really hard to measure the exact length of the center blocks. And Stuart Coffin's book of often show to look at the center point, which is obviously missing here, but to look at the center point visually and um, make a determination if it's too long or too short. And that's good um, for a while, but as you get further and further into um, the puzzles, you'll want to be able to measure that. And you can't do that with the center block itself. So how do you set the stop correctly to make center blocks? This is the method that I've come up with. So what I do is I cut off both ends of a stick here. First thing to do is to make sure that this end is square and I sh uh, sand it off all the burrs. You can see a little chamfer there. I put it in the cradle and, and use another stick that's also square on the end as a stop block. So I cut, cut this off on the one side and then I flip it over and make the next cut. So it's like the beginning of a um, squat octahedron block uh, cut there. And then I use my uh, stop block for the center block and I butt it up in there, clamp it down. I clamp it down only on one side when I make a center block because if I clamp it down on this side and the, the two pairs of cradles are slightly misaligned, it'll, it'll twist the angle just a little bit. And I set the angle using this side so I only clamp it on, on the one side and then let this piece just kind of kick back when, um, when it's severed clean. So what I do is I cut through it, and I cut pretty, pretty slow on this uh, jig so far, and what I end up with is something that looks like, like this block. You can see how that would come out of there after, you, after I cut through very slowly. Right, so now you can measure across these two flat sides, and that should be equal to the stock size that you use. So I use, and I used to use um, three quarter inch sticks, 0.750, but I've uh, downsized to 0.725 because uh, sometimes I buy lumber that's not much thicker than 7, 750. And so here you can see um, 0.725. That, we may not be able to see that in the focus. But um, this is how I measure the length of center blocks down to about a thousandth of an inch. It's much more accurate than trying to um, uh, just visually judge whether or not a center block is too long or too short. Okay. So one little tip that I've uh, come across that I thought that might be helpful. Okay. Um, to make the stop blocks themselves, there is a theoretical offset between um, the stop here on the end and where the stick goes. And to make that offset, I use uh, these metal gauge blocks, which are <coughs> tools that a machinist would use um, and they come in economy sets for pretty cheap, maybe about 50 bucks for that box full of uh, metal gauge blocks. And they measure very precisely. Um, even an economy set is a pretty, pretty uh, accurate set compared to most woodworking tools. And you can stack them up to make any measurement that you really want. Right. Um, that's the way they're designed. So I'll, I'm just using one block here, and it's obviously not the right one for a center, a center block stop. But 
this is the general way that I will go through this. I'll make, um, before I start a, a stop block, I'll make this side square and sand all the burrs off the edge. Then I would butt it up in here with the theoretical offset, which can be calculated, cut off the, um, the, the stick and make the stop block. So then what you do is you, for a center block, for example, you'd slide it back in here like this and then make the cut. So I would use a stick something like this, uh, clamp it down, make a center block. But before I would do that, I would make one of these that I can actually measure to cut it off. And if it's a little too long or a little too short, then I'll use a feeler gauge. And this is just an automotive set of feeler gauges that I took apart. They usually come in a set with a screw in the middle and they all uh, fit in, the, uh, in a holder. I just take them apart so I can slide a feeler gauge between the stop block and the the backstop here to um, move it out and that will make this block a little longer a little shorter usually a little shorter um, unless you cut this stop block too short to begin with um, usually you're going to be too long and you're going to creep up on um, the, the correct dimension um, through using feeler gauges and that's really um, the bulk of how I cut the pieces um, I can show you about how slow I make the cut um, without actually turning the blade on I actually cut very, very slowly because um, if we can't clamp it down very tight, and even if we could clamp it down very tight, there's still a chance that this thing can move. You push the stick into the blade too hard and the blade will actually um, put a force on the stick and that will change the alignment of the stick. And you'll always know because it'll burn uh, halfway through. Because if you imagine, if you get this far into a cut and it pushes it, it's gonna rub against the side of the blade as this angle is changed. And then when you pull it back, you'll hear it, and you'll see a burn mark up, up here somewhere, um, typically. Now this is a sawn surface. You can see there's no burn marks on there. Um, so I uh, adjust my feed speed until I can get that right. Um, but I really do feed it very, very slowly. Um, you know, probably about, about this slow, which takes an incredible amount of time and an incredible amount of concentration to do this over and over and over again to cut out hundreds of blocks sometimes um, in a run. Um, so, so when you're doing a run, how much are you going to cut out? Are you just going to bash out hundreds of blocks and then start putting things together or do you do one puzzle at a time? The most I usually batch out are about eight puzzles in one, in one batch and I'll try to do like eight puzzles in a week sometimes, um, which it makes it sound simple but it does take me all week to try to get stick, uh, blocks cut out, glue them all together, get the finish on them, get it waxed and then I'll do the next wave sometimes in the, in the next week. That, that's working on it every night um, and really working pretty hard out here um, late after, after my day job. Um, so about eight puzzles is what I uh, try to do in a batch. Sometimes, I don't always do that many. 